I'm here with Francis Chan, who is, I think, first thing to say is a friend. He's been, he spoke here a few years ago and gave an, um, an unforgettable talk at HTB. And then we had lunch with him and some of his family. I've been such an admirer of Francis Chan's preaching, his ministry, his, his writing Crazy Love, of course, is a book which has sold, I don't know how many, but I suspect millions of copies around the world. And uh, I don't want to waste any more time with the introduction because I want you to hear from him. So, Francis, just tell us, tell us about your, because you had the most extraordinary background growing up. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I love it. Uh, you know, my, uh, my mom died giving birth to me. My dad remarried and then my stepmother died when I was eight. My dad remarried again and then uh, he died when I was 12. And so burying my parents obviously has a huge effect on you as, as a little boy. And, and just the thoughts of, man, I've got to take this seriously. What happens when I die? And just got very, very serious about knowing that. You know, so while everyone else is having fun, playing, whatever, I'm thinking about eternity. Because I, I, when you bury your, your dad, that's, that's all you can think about, at least for me. And yet it caused me to seek after God. And when I found Jesus and really fell in love with him, then my, my biggest concern was all my friends and sharing the gospel with all of my friends and, you know, cutting class and telling my friends about Jesus. Because I'm thinking, we're talking about eternity. Like, What age were you and how did that happen? I think I fell in love with Jesus in around 15, 16. Hmm. And... And then just by sharing the gospel with all of my friends and not really want to do anything else, that's when I just felt like God was saying, do this with your life. And I talked to my youth pastor about it. And uh, and we both just felt like, yeah, this is my calling. So I was about 18. Did you have a Christian background? There was some. I mean, my my parents were believers, but it wasn't anything we ever talked about in the house. And... They, their first language is Chinese. And so there was just a real lack of communication, plus a terrible relationship with my dad to where we never even had a conversation. So it wasn't until after his death that uh, I really understood the gospel. Oh, amazing. And, then, and now you have the most, because I've met some of them, the most amazing family, amazing wife. And yes. she'll just say a little bit about, about that. Because that's such yeah. a contrast from your own family. Totally. I mean, I, I we have seven children. My wife and I have been married for 26 years. And I mean, our 25-year anniversary last year, she looks at me at dinner and goes, do you know anyone on earth happier than we are? Hmm. She goes, anyone that's more blessed than we are. And she goes, I keep thinking there's got to be someone out there that's as blessed as we are. She goes, but I, I've never met them. And I go, I feel the same way. Like, even, even when Lisa and I decided to move out here and take the, you know, the younger kids with us, our two married daughters and our son-in-laws, they fasted and prayed and individually came to us and said, we feel like God's calling us to go too. And so now there's 12 of us out here, like they, they live like two blocks from me. And, and it's like, my wife and I were in tears, like, who gets to do this? It's just everyone serving together. And we just love being together. Like, it's just so fun. I, I'm, I can't even believe it. And uh, uh, the title of your book, Crazy Love, needs no explanation when, when you hear you speaking about your love for Jesus, your love for your wife, your love for your children. Just say a bit more about because that book has, has such an impact. Just, what, what, what's the heart behind Crazy Love? The heart was, okay, once I got into the church and I'm studying the Bible, it, it had such an effect on me. Like, I'm going, wait a second, God is like that? No one ever told me he was like that. Like how holy, how huge, like, like we can't even look at him. He's so beyond us. And then that being, you're telling me he sacrificed for me, his son. Like, this is insane. It, 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 my whole life should revolve around this. I should have an insane response to that. And yet I'd look around the church and everyone's just kind of, 
hearing <laughs> another sermon, and I'm going, "Are you are you reading? Is is, is my Bible the same Bible you're reading? Because <laughs> this is freaking me out right now. This is everything to me, and and so for so much of my Christian life, I was kind of calmed down, like, hey. You know, like you'll, you know, it's the honeymoon phase. It's this, it's that. You don't have to be so serious. And I'm going, no, this seems very serious to me. And that's when I just felt like I need to write about this because I bet you there's other people like me that yeah. just feel like, man, I should devote everything to this. And you became a pastor and you built like a mega church, huge church, thousands of people um, in your church. And, and many people think, oh, that's the dream, you know, be a pastor, mega church. But you you built all that and you said, no, actually, now I'm going to do something totally different. I, I'm, I, I, I see something different and I want to do something different. Just explain why. Why did you decide that that, that was not the model for you to have, you know, one person and thousands yeah. of people? Well, it was really the elders that spoke to me. It was some of the the professors at our Bible college that were speaking to me, some of the students that were talking to me. And as we searched the word, we saw, man, God calls for a deep, deep, intense love. He says, like, like, Nick, if you and I are in a church together, I'm supposed to be one with you just as the father and son are one. I go, are you kidding me? Could you and I really be that close? And yet that's his prayer for us. And I'm thinking, we're nowhere near. That That hasn't even been a goal for us to be that perfectly one. And all of the one another's in scripture, and then the power of the Holy Spirit in every person's life. I'm going, I, I need everyone exercising their gift. I, I, I want this love between each other. I want this multiplication of, of leaders. We're all supposed to be disciple makers. And I realized everything was centered around me. And I, I just thought we, we've got to change that. So that was the idea of met many more just like small groups and people meeting in, in much smaller groups. Yeah, I, I think part of it was when I went, I had always heard about the underground church in China, yeah. but then to actually visit and see these believers that were so on fire, that, that felt like they walked right out of the New Testament, meeting these believers in India, same thing, that just, and yet they multiply to millions of people without a big name speaker. It was about everyone sharing the gospel. You know, a lot of what you emphasize in Alpha, it was just, it's just like everyone should be doing this. And But then it went beyond that to, to discipleship and planting these house churches. And, and I just saw the way they work together. And I just go, okay, this is what we need for the future. I also heard you speak about your, your trip to Myanmar. Um, and the impact that had on on you know the, what we read in the New Testament. We read in the New Testament all these amazing Book of Acts, healing, yeah. miracles, yeah. and we all believe yeah. that. But then, uh, where do we see that? Um, and uh, it's often on the front line that yeah. people see it. Just say just say about your experience. And you've seen it for years, but for me, I've believed it could happen. And then I started pursuing it, but I still didn't ever, I, I never saw it. And it wasn't until I was really desperate. I mean, here I am in a village that has never heard of Jesus, never, never heard the gospel and have been indoctrinated in another faith for their entire lives. And I'm going to come along and I get this one opportunity to tell them who Jesus is. And I was just trying to put myself in their shoes and go, how could I ever believe that kind of message unless there was just a power that night that I had never seen my entire life? And I begged God for that. And after sharing the gospel, we called people to come forward um, for prayer and Everyone I prayed for was healed. And I mean, I had to be the most excited guy in the room. And people were believing in Jesus and wanting more of Jesus. How many people were at the gathering? And, and how many people were you praying for? And how were you praying for them? There was probably, there were two different gatherings. In the village, I would guess there were like 200 people okay. in this upper room of the elders you know, uh, you know, um, 
gathering hall. I guess it's kind of his house too, but they're just cramming in. And it, it's, uh, I mean, there were people just saying, I have this crazy pain in my back, you know, I'd lay hands and it would be gone on oh, my knee. I haven't been able to stand up, uh, you know, boom, it's gone. I mean, I've prayed these prayers many times and nothing happens. Um, the most dramatic for me, I mean, there was another deaf girl that a couple of our friends prayed for, um, her and her brother, you know, deaf from birth, you know, that could hear now. And, but the most dramatic was this lady that came up, just her eye was swollen and so much pain in her head. She said, you hardly think, and it's all through a translator. So I prayed and she says, yes, the pain's completely gone. And she goes, but can you, take away the swelling and I'm like I'll give it a shot you know <laughs> and I pray and it like went down like halfway and my translator looks at me and goes does it look like it's halfway I go I think so I go, let's keep praying and so I did it again and he looks at me and goes I don't know if you see what I see but I don't see any swelling anymore I, go, I don't either this like this is uh it's just so fun. I just thought, I want to live this every night of my life. I, I want to see God work like this. Yeah. Um, and that night, there were probably 2,000 people at that gathering. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And what was the impact, you think, on, on that on that village? I mean, did the in terms of faith and Jesus? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are people now that are being discipled. Um, the, the, the lady that got us in there... She got there through just helping them dig wells and, you know, she bought some land from this or that. That's why they allowed this message to even come in. So she's still working with them. People are being discipled. You gave a talk. Uh, I don't know how long ago it was. The title is Lukewarm and Loving It. And I guess it's kind of the opposite of crazy love, lukewarm and loving it. Uh, but anyway, my daughter and um, a friend of hers listened to it. And it had such a profound impact on their lives. And I'm sure they must be one of probably hundreds of thousands of people who've listened to that talk. But just say a little bit about um, lukewarm and loving it. My concern was reading that passage in uh, Revelation 2 and, and uh, or Revelation, uh, the, the church in Laodicea, I forget if it's two or three. But uh, just going, wait a second, he's saying... Uh, you you are, you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, naked, blind, and he, he says, I, I, "I'm I'm asking you to repent, or I'm going to spit you out of my mouth." And he goes, "You're not hot, you're not cold," and 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 I just heard so many Christians kind of go, "Yeah, I'm lukewarm, I'm lukewarm," and I'm going, "That doesn't make sense." Like, if you're lukewarm, you're going to be spit out of the mouth of God. And, and people are going to say, well, I'm a lukewarm Christian. And I'm going, I don't think there's such thing. Because he's saying, if you're lukewarm, you're spit out of your mouth. You're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. Those are not terms he uses for his children. People were just too happy calling themselves lukewarm and thinking like there was a safety in that. And I'm going, that, I was telling people like, you shouldn't go to work tomorrow. You shouldn't do anything until you have this figured out. So, yeah, sorry for hey, me preaching. Okay, okay, so Francis, supposing someone's watching this right now mm. and they're saying, yeah, that's me. And I, that's not how I want to be. Um, I want to be like Francis. I want to be like Francis. Like, mm -hmm. I want to be filled with that love. Uh, mm. will, you, will you pray for them right now? Will you, will you, will you lead them in a prayer? Lead them in yes. a way that they can say to the Lord, Lord. Yes, and I, Father, I just pray for anyone right now. God, who really doesn't know you, that you would pour your grace out right now. Because you're the only one that can do it. You're the only one who can open eyes. Please, God, show them how quick this life ends. Show them your beauty your glory like gosh to be loved by you protected by you for all of eternity may they see the worth of a god who would give his only son to die for our sins would you open their eyes to to your greatness that they would want you as their king 
and want to be a part of this kingdom. Oh, God, would your Holy Spirit open eyes right now. And if that's you, just tell God, Lord, I see your beauty right now. And I don't want to lead my own life. I want you to lead me. I'll walk away from anything to be one with you. I want your spirit in me. Come into me now and change the rest of the time I have on this earth until I see your face. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, Francis, thank you so much. Uh, your words are, are so powerful. and Prayer was so powerful and a huge privilege for us to have you with us, uh, both, both at HGV and to all the other churches that are joining us today. Uh, on behalf of them all, I want to say just massive thank you to you. Thank you so, so much.